So today, today we're stuck. The story that we shared this morning that's the beginning of our summer worship series is the story of a young boy named Floyd whose kite was stuck in a tree. And it was really stuck. So as you heard with the children, he went and he threw his shoe to try to get that kite unstuck from the tree. And when that didn't work, he threw his other shoe and that got stuck in the tree as well. And so he marches off and he gets Mitch, the family cat, and he throws Mitch up in the tree And when Mitch gets stuck up in the tree, then Floyd marches off to get a ladder. And those of us who are reading the story think, ah, he's got it. Except, of course, he throws the ladder up in the tree, and it gets stuck too. And then so begins a story where one thing after another after another is stuck up in the tree. The kite was really stuck. But it wasn't the only thing. Floyd, Floyd was stuck too. Floyd was stuck in one way of thinking about how to solve his problem. Floyd was stuck in one pattern of doing things over and over and over again. He had an idea about how to get his kite down, and he was going to follow through on that idea no matter what until it worked, without knowing if it was ever going to work. It's sort of just luck, right, that the saw is the last thing, the tree is too full, and the tiny saw, and again, that's another moment where we think, now he's got it. And he throws the saw up in the tree, and down comes the kite. And of course, by that point, he's forgotten about everything else because he was, again, stuck. And he saw his kite, and off he goes. Floyd was stuck. I wonder how many of us have ever felt like Floyd. I have. Have you ever felt stuck in how to solve a problem? Have you ever felt stuck in how to move forward on something? Have you ever felt stuck in a situation at work or at home? Have you ever felt stuck looking at your to-do list and thinking, I can only see one way forward and I don't think it's going to be enough to get this all done? I have felt that. Have you ever felt stuck? I have. And I have to say to you that one of the really nice things, and there are other nice things, but one of the nice things about working in a ministerial team with two other talented and wonderful clergy as colleagues is that we can help each other get unstuck sometimes. There are a lot of times when I feel overwhelmed by the details of what I need to get done or by the way that I think I need to accomplish all the things on my plate, and I can't see another way to do it. But Beth and Kent, they're not down in that same mire that I'm in. They might have their own mire, but they're not in mine. And they can come and look at it with fresh eyes and new ideas, and sometimes what they can suggest to me seems so easy and so obvious. I was just too stuck to figure it out. You know, what if somebody else had walked by right when Floyd's kite got stuck up in the tree and he started throwing things? That whole story might have been a lot shorter. <laughs> or yeah, or Floyd might have thrown him up there too, says Pam. <laughs> Which ultimately the firefighters do come by and they, yeah, they get thrown up in the tree. You know, we can help each other get unstuck. That's a gift that we can give each other. I, hopefully, can help Kent and Beth get unstuck sometimes. They can help me, and we all can do that for each other. That's one of the gifts of sharing this journey together. We may feel stuck, but we have all of these other wonderful, creative, talented people who are here on this journey with us who can help us, nudge us along, get us out of that rut. Sometimes we just get stuck. Yesterday, when I was coming to the church to try to work on this sermon for a little while, I was actually literally and figuratively stuck, kind of like Floyd. Because when I left my house, which is not far from here at all, and I probably should have walked, I had forgotten that Arts Fest was going on, and so that the streets around the church were blocked off. And so I came up, and then I remembered as I was going, and in fact, I have to say, my babysitter was going to Arts Fest after, and we had just talked about it when I left the house. When I got here, I saw that Cabot Street was closed, and I said, well, that's no problem. I'll just go down Dane Street to Hale and come up from the back of the church. But when I did that, I got to about the fire station and discovered Hale Street was closed before the church parking lot, and I thought, well, that's no problem. I'll just go park on Abbott Street and go in the Abbott Street door. But of course, because it was Arts Fest, there was no parking on Abbott Street. So I drove around in circles an embarrassing number of times. Not even circles, because Cabot Street was closed, so it was kind of this weird zigzag pattern before I realized that I could stop and ask the firefighters who I had driven by an embar- firefighters again, an embarrassing number of times who were standing outside the fire station, would it be okay if I went past that 
roadblock and just drove as far as the First Baptist Church parking lot. I worked there. And they said, sure. <laughs> I was stuck. I was literally stuck driving around, but I also was stuck in this one way of thinking. I was stuck thinking that road is closed. There is no other option. There's nothing I can do about this. Until finally I asked for help. And I got some. Sometimes we just get stuck. You know, I have to say, as I was thinking about this book this week, and about being stuck, all I could think of was that our country, in many ways, we're stuck. We're stuck. And even though it might seem like I really like preaching sermons where I talk about gun violence, I don't. I just feel like there's been a high number of Sundays where I've ended up on the preaching rotation after a tragedy in our country. And Kent and Beth probably feel the same way because statistically, we keep preaching after tragedies. It feels like we're stuck. And I have to tell you that it wouldn't bother me if I never preached another sermon about gun violence again. So even though it might seem like this is a topic I return to, I don't know how to gather in this place, in this house of God, in this place of worship, the Sunday after the most deadly shooting in American history, and not try to grapple with what it means. Not try to grapple with what it means that we seem to be stuck in this tragic and sad cycle. And to not try to grapple with what our role in it, however small, what our role in getting ourselves unstuck might be. It also reminded me, as I was thinking of a quote from the district manager that I used to work for back in my retail management days. And uh, interestingly, I went back to look and see when I had last used this quote from Wendy, and it was in a sermon about this topic. But I'm going to quote her again. She had what we called Wendy-isms. They were like little quips for retail, but also really for life. And so she would use these on us a lot. We didn't love them because we heard them when we were not doing as well as she'd hoped. But the one that I want to share with you is that she would frequently say to us when we seemed stuck, you know, if you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got. That's kind of annoying when you're stuck. But she's right. And when it comes to the way that our country is stuck, we're stuck in a pattern where we keep doing what we always did. We keep getting what we always got. When I was doing some research for this sermon, I looked and CNN had a very helpful but very depressing list on their website online of the deadliest shootings in our history. The one that happened last Sunday in the early morning hours in Orlando at the Pulse nightclub, an attack that targeted the LGBTQ community, and specifically communities of color, that we know has been the deadliest. 50 lives lost, many more injured, many more traumatized. The next deadliest shooting on the list was the one that happened in 2007 at Virginia Tech, in which 32 people died. And third on the list was the 2012 shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut, where 27 people died. And although it did not make this sad list of most deadly shootings, I am also mindful as we stand here that we have recently passed the one-year anniversary of the shooting in Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, where a white shooter targeted black churchgoers after joining them for Bible study time. And so when it comes to being stuck, we're stuck when it comes to violence. We're stuck because racism and homophobia continue to pervade our society we're stuck because in some ways they've been the driving force behind some of these crimes. We're stuck. And yet if we keep doing what we always did, we'll keep getting what we always got. And none of us want that. Not one of us, I'm guessing, in this sanctuary wants to come in here again and light candles like this in memory of lives that were cut too short, stories that were ended too soon. But what can we do? You know, I wish that I could stand here and tell you that I have the answer. I wish I had the magic key that would take us right through this door, but I don't. 
But I have, like many of you, I'm sure, pondered, I've wondered, I've prayed, I've thought about it. What is my role? What can I do in my small corner of the world? What can we do? What can you do? And this might seem small, but the first thing that's come to me is that I thought about the ways that Beth and Kent and I get each other unstuck, the ways that you get each other unstuck. And I thought maybe one of the best things that we can do right now is talk to each other. These are hard topics. These are not the kind of topics that most people want to bring up around the Thanksgiving Day table or the Christmas table or the Easter table or with a casual friend that you knew in high school. That's really hard. But I thought maybe the best thing for us to do is to begin to be able to engage in conversations with one another in which we really try to hear each other. But we also stand firmly, lovingly, bravely for that which we believe. Too often when this national conversation starts up, it gets really hard. It gets acrimonious at times. And we kind of put it back to bed until we're back here lighting candles again. That's really hard. It's a hard topic to broach, but maybe that's the first step to getting ourselves unstuck. And you know, I have to say, I, I have friends, I know many people, I have friends who are very responsible gun owners who like to go for target practice at a gun range. They keep their guns locked in a gun safe at home. They keep their ammunition locked separately. They're very responsible gun owners. So I think we're talking about something different here. It's not about people who are already doing the right thing. It's about how do we as a nation move to a place where all of us together can be safer. Maybe conversation, standing firmly and lovingly for what we believe, is a way to help to nudge each other into getting unstuck. And this past week, Wednesday into the early morning hours of Thursday, we saw Senator Chris Murphy from Connecticut begin to do some of that. Now, whether or not you agree in principle with whether holding the Senate floor is an appropriate tactic to take, and I'm guessing for most of us, I think for me, I realized, whether we think a filibuster is exciting depends largely on who you think the filibuster is for and what it's serving. But taking that out of the equation, he tried something different. He tried something different than allowing the regular business of the Senate to continue to flow on the Senate floor. He used almost 15 hours. He and his colleagues from both sides of the political aisle, they used 15 hours, and they didn't use those 15 hours to read the phone book or to read Green Eggs and Ham. They used their 15 hours to talk about the stories of those who had been killed in gun violence in our country. They used their 15 hours to talk about the realities that we face, the difficulties of this conversation, the places we get stuck. Can you imagine standing in one place for 15 hours? I can't. But they did it. And they used those 15 hours to tell these 50 stories, to tell stories from Newtown, to tell stories from Virginia Tech, to tell the stories, to open the conversation. I watched sort of off and on some of that footage, and there were two moments that stood out to me. And one of them is especially touching, I think, because it's Father's Day, but one of them was when Chris Murphy's oldest son appeared in the gallery. He didn't know his son was coming to watch him, and so then he looked up and, you know, spectators can come and sit in the gallery, and there his son was, and Chris Murphy addressed him, his oldest son. He said, this was about eight hours into this, this was at the eight-hour mark, and he said, A, go to bed, B, I'm sorry I missed pizza night, and see, I hope someday you'll understand why we're doing this. I hope someday you'll understand why we're doing this, he said to his son. And I hope someday you'll know that sometimes, even if you don't get everything you want, standing for what you believe and trying to do good is almost as good as getting everything you want. That was one of the moments. Standing for what we believe and trying to do good sometimes is as good as getting what we want. And that's something that's in our control, each one of us. We can stand for what we believe. We can listen to others with respect, and we can try to do as much good in our corner of the world as we can. 
The other moment that I have no hope of getting through telling you without crying, I'm sure, was when he closed. He was going to close his 15 hours and yield the floor of the Senate. And he closed by sharing the story of Dylan Hockley, who was one of the children who died at Sandy Hook. And he talked about Dylan. He had a picture of Dylan. And he said that this little six-year-old boy had autism. And so Dylan had been assigned an aide to work with him every day, one-on-one. -on -one. Her name was Anne Marie Murphy. And Dylan loved her. And she loved him. He had a picture on his refrigerator of Anne Marie Murphy, and she was one of the major reasons he loved going to school. And so, Chris Murphy, who literally was elected to the Senate for Connecticut a month before this shooting, he was a brand new senator, he recalled going to the fire station in Newtown where the families had gathered either to be reunited with their children or to get the news that no parent wants to get. He and his fellow senator from Connecticut arrived there, and he said that a lot of the parents of children who had died had already realized their children were not there among their classmates. But Dylan Hockley's mother was still standing outside. She was waiting. And he said he remembers her coming to the conclusion that Dylan was not going to be coming out of the school. And then he said she paused and sort of brightened for a moment and said, well, maybe if, if Dylan's not, then maybe Anne Marie will. And she can tell me what Dylan, what, what happened. And then he said she realized almost immediately that if Dylan had not come out of the school, neither had Anne Marie. Because, he said, she knew that Anne Marie Murphy would not have left her son's side. And when the police finally were able to go in the building, they discovered that her mother's intuition was right because they found Dylan Hockley wrapped in the loving embrace of Anne Marie Murphy. A final act of love for a scared child. And Chris Murphy said, it doesn't take courage for me to stand here and talk to you about something that 90% of Americans already want. But it took courage for Anne Marie Murphy to do that. Thank you. And if she could do that, what can each one of us do? to ensure that Orlando, Sandy Hook, that these things don't happen again. And I think that's the question for each one of us. In what ways can we be courageous in our, in our lives to do a part, to be in conversation with one another or with our elected officials through email or through letter, on social media, if that's your thing? In what ways can we open up these conversations that are so difficult and to have that courage, to have that courage to help us together get unstuck. Our scripture readings this morning, there were two, and in them we hear through the voice of Isaiah, God promising to do a new thing. And then we hear in the letter of James that we need works with our faith. And taken together, I think these two scriptures are a recipe for what we are called to do in our own lives. Because these two scriptures together tell us, assure us, give us the hope and the faith that God is in the business of doing something new all the time. God is in the business of helping to get us unstuck. God came in the form of Jesus to help us get unstuck. That's how much God loves us. That's a part of it. And the other part of it is that we are not called to be the passive bystanders in God's work. We're called to be active participants. We're called to put works to our faith. God is in the business of doing a new thing. We are called to be God's partners. We are called to work together with God, to follow the example of Jesus, to walk that path that was already shown to us, to build up love and hope, peace, and joy. We can be God's partners in that. That's our calling. That's the hope. God is doing a new thing. And we are all invited into it. So come as together we respond to that call. Come and bring our hope our love, our kindness, our joy, bring those things out into the world. The world needs it. Our country needs it. We all need it. So come.
together. And let's be free. Amen.